This is the MZ EP11 playback only portable mini disc unit. This here is a pre mastered copy of Michael Jackson's Thriller on mini disc. This here is the Sony MZ N505 portable mini disc player and recorder. And this, of course, here is a recordable and re recordable mini disc. Now, audio mini disc is something that you can find all over YouTube. And everybody knows audio mini disc because that was the number one thing that mini disc was known for. But we already know from one of my previous videos that MD data was the thing. That's why we have the data EDA. So, really, if you want to watch a video regarding me talking about MD audio, that's not going to happen. Personally, go watch Tech Moan's retrospective on Minidisc. It's far more comprehensive and, well, he does a far better job at it than I would right now. But anyways, this video here is going to be dedicated to MD Data. And again, like I said, the Data Eta is an MD Data product. Sony also had MD Data used with multi-track audio recording units, as well as they were using it with cameras to store images as well. But the actual data part of MD data, where does that come in? Well, also, Sony did manufacture um, internal and portable drives for MD data. And for many years, I didn't actually have one of these. They're really uncommon. But now, I finally do have one, and that would be the MDH-10. This is the portable model here, and it's in the box. It's amazing. The, again, um, these are way more common to find than the internal model, which is the MDM-111. I've only seen um, just like press release photos of it, and I believe one person has a unit. But other than that, I've never seen them. And they have to be on obtaining them at this point here. Um, finding an MDH-10, uh, one, it's going to be a lot nicer because you can use it with both laptops and desktops. And they're smaller. Um, and they're portable devices that also work as uh, portable mini disc audio, audio units. And for the remainder of this video here, this is our centerpiece. Let's talk about this damn thing. Now, I didn't pay way too much money for this, or, well, not even $100 at all to get this exact unit here. Um, and this is how you would have found it um, in retail back in the day. And just because it's in such amazing shape here, it is scuffed a little bit. There's a couple, like, bit of damage to the box here that I don't really care about, but this gives me a great opportunity to give you an unboxing of the drive just so you know what exactly what it would have felt like when you got one brand new. Now you look at the front of the packaging here, you can clearly see, clearly see it's got the drive right over here, and you can see that there's the cartridge down there, and it specifies quite happily here that this Sony product has a 140 megabyte capacity in two and a half inch disc cartridges. It uses the standard SCSI 2 interface, so no parallel and definitely no USB. It will work on battery operation, and I would not really be expecting anything less out of this here. Um, at the time, there was already battery-powered magneto-optical devices, and Minidisc itself was already available um, in battery operation. It does support the audio Minidisc in playback capabilities only. So you can't record with this unit here at all. And it does have drivers for both the Windows and the Macintosh systems. Now, it doesn't really work with Linux or Unix or any other operating systems that haven't been listed here. And we'll get into that one there a little bit later. But on the back of the slot unit box here, it's a, tri it's a very trilingual item. And it specifies that the standard accessories in this box here we would find would be headphones with a remote controller, the AC power adapter, one recordable MD data cartridge, and I'm assuming also the MD data unit itself, an LIP12 rechargeable battery, and that's more than likely going to be lithium, a battery case, the carrying case, and the installation software for DOS slash Windows and the Macintosh operating systems. And then it goes on right down here to specify the system requirements for the PC side and the Macintosh side here. It does say that the SCSI um, host adapter card specified is the Adaptic AHA 151 or 154 series um, or future domain T um, TMC 850 cards, or is that 580? Uh, no 850 series cards. Now, there are a couple of commercial photographs of the MD data unit, and it has its own fancy looking Sony SCSI card. And what, in fact, it actually is, is one of Adaptex products right here. Now, this one here is the 
1450B that I had upside down. But at the end of the day, it's just a PCM CIA or a card bus device, depending on the model, with a hard fix SCSI cable, which comes over to a mini uh, HD50 pin connector on the other side here. And it's worth pointing out with this HD50 here, if you're not positive that this actually plugged into your device, at the very bottom of the box here, it shows a SCSI connector and specifies it's the actual size. So when you were in the store, you could have brought your own SCSI cable in, or you could have looked at the other SCSI cable products that they had at the store, taken the box or the cable to it, and just said, huh, yes, okay, that is actually the exact same size. So this is going to be the product that I'm going to need with it. Anyways, other than that, nothing special about the box. Let's get inside the box itself. I'm just going to do this. And this is not, I've opened this once before, so anyways. So we're going to open it up immediately. And it's worth pointing out with this package here, I do not have the headphones. Um, not that I'm really missing a whole heck of a lot. Um, headphones can be easily found um, back then, especially more so today. But the first thing we find here is the installation software. It comes on a three and a half inch floppy disk, one for the Macintosh for DOS and Windows, and one for the Macintosh. Both of these diskettes are imaged because I'm not aware of any other copies existing on the internet. Um, if someone knows a fantastic place for me to archive these drivers, um, leave something in the comments below. Going beyond that, I can fold this side off here. This is the obvious MD data unit. I'm going to put that off for now. We received the one 140 megabyte MD data cartridge, and it comes in this nice little plastic carrying case. The cartridge itself is, honestly, it is, it looks completely like a mini disc. And in fact, in comparison, I have over here a three and a half inch uh, magneto optical cartridge, and you can clearly see it is a fair bit smaller than the magneto optical cartridge. I'm just going to put that back in here for now. The next thing we have in here, this is battery carrying unit. We'll get back to that in a moment. And we have a remote control. This is not the original remote control to the unit. And I actually, if I flip this open here and you can see, it uses this style of remote control here. Um, I don't have one of these. I do have a rather large collection of mini disc peripherals and units and not that remote itself. So unfortunately, I won't be able to show off that one there. This remote here, while it does work on my other audio um, mini disc units, does not want to work on this unit here. So there's something very specific about that other remote. Oh well, I don't have that. And at the very bottom of the packaging here, we do have the MDH-10 owner's manual, which is still taped shut. It's never been red and well nothing surprising there and there's a warning back here about read this important information before using your headset and this is probably going to give you a bit more information on how to wear them and avls and all that jazz nothing all that special and if i roll this part of the packaging over hidden away in here we have the ac adapter which is a fairly large brick this is six volts 1200 milliamps with a small dc jack on the other side here and a reasonably sized barite core over here that's shrink wrapped on. Anyways, let's go on to our main part of the show here in this package. We have the carrying case for the unit. Come on. There we go. And it does have this nice, not I wouldn't so much say embroidered, but this little badge that's put onto the front of the carrying unit that specifies this is an MD data product. And inside that is the actual MDH-10 unit itself, which isn't all that big. It fits in the palm of your hand. And for comparison, this is the Pinnacle Micro Tahoe three and a half um, inch magneto optical drive. So again, it's fairly smaller. And this here is battery powered as well. But anyways, so we go back quickly here to this battery carrier. And all this does here is it just holds a couple of extra alkalines in case the rechargeable battery fails or if you've worked with audio mini discs and recorded in the field with the portable units, you'll find they really drain the battery when you record. And this one here, it seems, has never been used because it still has a little tiny warning inside of it indicating that, I gotta read this, turn it away to read it here. It is recommended to keep the supplied lithium ion battery in the drive even when R6 size AA alkaline batteries are used. It is a lithium ion device. Okay. Anyways, on the side of the unit here, we have our DC jack and we have this little tiny um, screw hole right here. 
and there's a notch right at the front, which kind of lines up with this. So I would just kind of plug it in to the side of the unit, and there's a little twisty screw in the bottom I would use to tighten this onto the side. It adds a little bit to the width, but also gives me battery, so now I have a backup battery system for it, or if I just don't want to use the rechargeable, whatever. And there you go. On the top of the unit here specifies again Sony. There's the MD Data logo right down here. We do have a power light here. This here will blink um, amber when it's charging or if there's a battery issue. I'm not entirely sure. We'll get to that. And there's another LED over here, which is a green busy or activity light. So when the drive is currently accessing the, the uh, cartridge itself. On the front of the unit here, we do have a little window so that I'm assuming when you have your cartridge installed, if you have a label on the front of your cartridge, you can actually see it inside here. And that's important because when you're, when the drive is mounted, like it's mounted within the operating system, or I believe even if you're playing music, the open close switch, which if I can find it, there it is, everything's backwards for me in this photo. Um, I can open it like this and I can just insert the cartridge. However, when I'm accessing, this actually has a little tiny solenoid inside the unit, which will lock out this slider. So I'd have to um, unmount it or stop whatever I'm playing before I could get back at my cartridge. Now, also on the front here, we do have our headphone slash um, Sony special remote connector. And that's all there is to the front of it. To the side of it here, we have our line out. We do have a line level out. I'm not entirely sure why, but okay, that's kind of cool. We have the AVLS automatic volume limiting system, which is present inside this unit here. And then we have this green slider switch that goes one way or the other. You cannot have this just on or off. You slide one direction to enable the audio playback mode of the unit. You slide the other direction to go into the data op mode of the unit. And then we have this door over here, which actually hides the lithium battery. And this battery here is a lithium ion um, LIP12 rechargeable battery. And I'm more than certain that it's just one lithium cell inside this fancy little cartridge here. And it has a little slider actually over the contacts. So you can't actually short the battery out um, when it's outside of the unit. But this battery here is very much dead. So it will have to be rebuilt if I want to use it. But otherwise, it's just got this nice keen so I can put it in to the unit one particular way and then close it. Again, there was nothing to script about this side here. We already covered over that. The back of the unit looks fairly bland, but it actually has a little cover right here. And this little cover, if I flip it open, reveals that we do have our HD50 SCSI connector right here and a set of dip switches. Now, these dip switches are all marked down here on what they do. So the one on the far end here sets um, SCSI bus termination, and that is required for an external device in many, if not all cases. And it wouldn't hurt to do it anyways, because we don't have a second SCSI connector, so we can't actually install um, another device in the chain or another terminator. And then we have the other dip switches here, which set the SCSI ID in case, well, you don't want to have it defaulted on ID 1 or ID 4. Other than that, that's everything there is inside of the package here. So I think we should clean this up and give ourselves a little bit of a demonstration. Now, because I actually have both the drivers for the PC and the Macintosh, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna set up on a PC and a Macintosh, both driver sets, and then we can see exactly how the MDJDA drive responds, how it transfer files, and just simply how it works. Now, there might be other operating systems that it supports, but at least in this case here, I'm not aware of any. Maybe the Japanese version has the PC-98. Well, unfortunately, in that case, I don't own a PC-98, so I can't demonstrate in that. But anyways, let's get to the first machine. All right, let's get started on the PC side. Now, for this demonstration here, I'm currently using an IBM ThinkPad 380XD with Microsoft Windows 98 Second Edition on it. Now, it's good that I'm running Second Edition because with that Adaptec 1460C SCSI card I have, I can simply plug it in and this is one of those few things under the plug and pray of the 9X era where it's actually supported right out of the operating system here. And there we go. And it just showed up there. And I already have the MD data drive attached and it says it's right there as a removable disk. However, if I, however, if I try to use it or access it right off the bat here, no drivers or anything, I, it doesn't know what the hell to do with it. So we need to go and install the software for it. Now, I mentioned before that this didn't really seem like a very new product. Again, 1994, Windows 95 wasn't a thing yet. Windows 98 was still far away. 
But already I'm starting to see these vibes here that this is definitely a product for Windows 3.1, just the layout and feel of it. But okay, I'm going to go with the default install. And I don't care about any of this here because we're doing the standard PC and it's just gonna load the files off of the floppy disk, which is not a whole hell of a lot. And it also adds a line to my autoexec.bat for MD Manager and MDFSEX. Ooh, that's a pretty risque name there. MDFSEX, maybe? Got to finish with plywood. Anyways, MDFSEX and MD Manager. This one we're gonna be a bit more interested in, but it just creates it and modifies it. We're gonna say, okay, and I must reboot for anything to take effect here. Exiting, and now we have two things here that are show up in my program directory of, well, programs, uh, MD format and MD play. Before either of those are usable, we have to reboot the machine. And that's just a simple case of restarting. Now, like I said before, oh, wait, I have a floppy disk still in the drive. There we go. Now, like I was saying before, this felt like a very much a Windows 3.1 application. Windows 3.1 is different from the Windows 9X kernel in that it loads after DOS has finished processing everything. Because our two MD applications are in autoexec.bat, they're going to process then card services. There we go, card services came on, but it said no MD manager, no MD data devices found. Again, um, the PC card services hadn't started yet for Windows, so PCM CIA was up, no SCSI, no MD data. So we're gonna reboot Windows here, and it's gonna be all confused because it can't find anything. Hmm, okay, so it can see removable disk D. It's actually bumped my CD drive to E, but it seems that if I still click on it, no, I don't wanna do that. And if we go to the applications, which are currently sitting in their little program directory here, so we have MD format or MD play, MD play, what does it give me? Unable to find MD data device application will now abort. However, if we were to go, all right, this isn't Windows NT, I can't do it that way. If we go to a, DOM, to a DOS, prompt, DOS prompt, and I do the two applications that it was looking for, so MDMGR, there we go. Using device MDFSEX, install OK, it actually sees it there. And then MDFSEX, which is actually the Minidisc file system extension. MD data does not use FAT, it doesn't use um, um, HFS, it doesn't use anything like that. It's uh, a foreign file system to both the PC and the Macintosh. But now that I have it mounted here and it specifies that it's drive F, I go to F, there we go. And I've already done one experimentation on this, so if I were to go to do a DIR, it will take a moment to spin up the disk here, and then boom, it sees a whole bunch of mini files that I've dropped onto it. And it does indeed work. It specifies 140 megabytes or 140 million bytes. For, yeah, there we go. But it sees and it works, but of course, it's only gonna be working right now in DOS. Still under Windows, it has no idea what the hell to do with it. Even if I go over to the erase utility, it's going to say, oh, there's nothing there. Oh shoot, that actually worked. But, oh, nope, no MD drive was found in the system. So I can't do anything with that. Well, that's a damn shame there. Unfortunately, so no audio playback. I get to work with under DOS. If I could figure out a way to process the two, um, the two items after card services come up, and that's pretty, I'm pretty sure that's just a simple little batch processing thing or a batch file to take care of that. Boom, we'll have it work under Windows 95 and 98, no problem. Under Windows 3.1, this wouldn't be a problem at all because again, Windows 3.1 is loaded after DOS has finished processing all of its um, at boot execu um, executables. Okay, now let's go over to the Macintosh side of things. So I've already transferred everything over. Um, the MD data drive is currently plugged into this PowerBook G3, the uh, Main Street series, um, using the uh, Apple PowerBook SCSI adapter and an HT50 SCSI adapter cable. Apple System Profiler, amusingly, however, sees the MD data drive. Uh, it understands it's an MDH10 from Sony, but it sees it as a tape drive for some reason. But anyways, you insert the diskette, you're gonna get your little floppy here, and you're gonna end up with a control panel and two extensions and a README, one marked E, one marked J. The F, README with bra J in brackets is the Japanese version of the README file. The English version, as it's, well, not surprising, is just the text, for, uh, the English version of the README. And it does cover over a couple of things in here. Um, it does specify that with the limitations here, if I can scroll down, oh, nope. 
Uh, you can't use a hybrid MD data uh, cartridges with this version of the installation software. You cannot share MD data volumes through Apple Share. You cannot use an MD data drive to boot the Macintosh. And there is a limit of full to the number of folders you can have on an MD data cartridge, which apparently seems to be approximately 500. But for installation, it's going to be a lot more straightforward because up until OS X, really installing drivers in that was easy. So we're going to take the control panel and the two extensions, and I'm just going to drop those into the system folder. Mm, yes, I don't care. And it's just going to transfer those over. And then we can go and we can reboot. Now, the Macintosh system software doesn't show off a fancy icon when it's booting up. So you don't really have any verification that the driver has loaded at all until you come back up to the desktop. Once you reach the desktop, however, because I still had the MD data cartridge still inserted into the drive from that last experience on Windows, it automatically mounted and it calls it MD data 140. And it has a fancy little MD data cartridge icon which comes with it. And if I open that up, there's all of the MIDI files that I previously loaded. And again, um, this isn't HFS. Um, this isn't uh, this isn't fat. So these files here um, are working in some other format that I have no guarantee that the resource fork is good, but it guarantees that for these MIDI files, um, when I transfer them over to this machine, I can, can translate them via QuickTime, and they're going to play back as QuickTime files. as all impressive as they are. Now exactly for that control panel we saw, if we go over to the control panels, we get MD file system, and you get one option. And it says, use SGIS code. And a little tiny area above it, please check below only when you use the Japanese language kit. Of course, I don't have that installed, so I don't need to select it. But other than that, the only thing that we have left that was on that diskette that we saw earlier that we did not install, dun 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 the MD player. So we actually have an audio playback utility so I can actually play music through my Macintosh directly. Now, at least under the Macintosh environment, I'm able to use the accessories that come with the MD data unit um, as they should. That includes the audio player. Vaporwave, anyone? Now, once the audio MD settles in the MDH10, you just end up with a floppy disk icon that's marked audio MD. If you open that, you'll end up with a whole bunch of audio tracks, but each and every one of them is, oh, well, no, they just all vanish there. You actually end up, I guess in this case here, with one track indicating 0K. So I'm not going to care about that, but if we go back over to our player, which I just loaded onto the hard drive, we do end up with a very fancy mini disc player, and I'm able to play my favorite Vaporwave tracks all I want on the Macintosh. Yeah, you get the idea. Anyways, fancy little min it basically makes the MDH10 into a very fancy um, portable mini disc player, and you makes your Macintosh a fancy remote. If you don't want to use the line out on this here, you can still plug in headphones, but again, you're using the Macintosh to control it. But other than that, there you have it. That's MD Data for you. Now, maybe I should at least go over the history of MD Data just a little bit in this video here as well, since we're getting near the end. But let's also answer at the same time that question, whatever happened to MD data? Was it subsidized or subsidized by the original Megiddo optical cartridge? That didn't happen. Remember, MD data was supposed to replace the floppy disk in the eyes of Sony. And these little cartridges here had one problem. They were up against the zip cartridge. We love them, we hate them. In 1994, MD data came out, and it was 140 megabytes. That 40 extra megabytes was a little bit better than the zip cartridge, but at $25 for an MD data cartridge and about $15 for a zip cartridge, the zip disk was already winning on price, even if it didn't have the capacity. Now, Sony later on did re release a later version of MD data, which could hold about 630, 640 megabytes. Uh, per cartridge, which brought you up to, at the time, the three and a half inch magneto optical cartridges. 
but it still wasn't uh, an item that was getting much success at all. Again, the zip disk was winning. And much later on, with high MD, we suddenly had the ability to start using um, regular audio MDs, uh, MD data, and high MD cartridges to store even more data onto a mini disk cartridge. However, by that time there, the USB stick had caught a hold of the market, and even for the zip disk, its days were numbered, and there wasn't much left. Sony withdrew completely out of the mini disk line in 2013, and that was it. That was the end for MD data. And it's a real shame, honestly. I've always been a fan of Magneto Optical, so maybe I am being a little bit biased here. But I think the idea of storing 140 megabytes on such a little tiny cartridge, which is also very durable, um, is really cool. Anyways, I really hope you enjoyed this video, and I hope you enjoyed these demonstrations. But until next time, have a good one.